news that a few people who have read the book in this crowd gave me was that even though the book is about a subject matter that seems foreign, um, it does read like a suspense thriller. By some people, it's been described as uh, the, the Iranian version of In Cold Blood. So at least you won't be bored. <laughs> this is my way of saying. Those of you who know the book also know that every chapter of the book begins with a joke from an Iranian satirist. When I gave the manuscript to my intern, um, I teach a writing course at Yale, and I gave it to my intern. I said, could you please fact check this? And um, she took the manuscript. She went through it really quickly. And um, I said, I, I'm happy to hear any feedback you might have. And the first thing she said was that I didn't know Iranians could be funny. <laughs> and, and I said, why do you think that? Why do you think we are not funny? And she said, because you, know, you, you always show up in front of the television and you look very angry throwing your fists in front of the cameras. So um, I realized that uh, the coverage that Iran gets in the press uh, gives the view that Iranians don't have a sense of humor. So I decided to begin today with some of the jokes that are in the book, just to show that we are funny people. And I have some compatriots here um, who are probably even funnier than I am. The jokes that are in the beginning of every chapter in the book uh, are from a satirist, uh, an Iranian satirist who is very political. And um, as, as it happens, and as you can guess, uh, because of his satire, he himself uh, landed on this uh, list of people that Iran wanted to, the government wanted to assassinate. So, um, so these are from him. A political activist was arrested in Iran and was asked why he had a picture of Jesus on his wall, but not that of the Iranian supreme leader. The activist said, if they drive nails through the leader and post them alongside the road, just like Jesus, I'll have his picture on the wall too. <laughs> Despite what uh, many people think, there is freedom of speech in Iran, only there is no freedom, of freedom after speech in Iran. <laughs> the man who translated the satanic verses into Arabic was kidnapped. Do you remember the yeah. uh, Salman Rushdie book? When he begged his captors not to kill him, they said the Ayatollah would pardon him only if he would undo his sin by translating the book back into English. <laughs> Today, some scholars argue that the retranslated version is a major improvement on Rushdie's original work. So, I guess um, I need to explain why I wanted to write a book about a grisly murder. Because I'm not a grisly person, and I generally am the person who um, refuses to go to horror movies and changes the channel whenever somebody picks up a gun um, on television. Um, so I have to, in, given my own nature, I have to explain why I decided to do a book about political assassinations. The most important reason is that many political assassinations happen by the Middle Eastern governments, most recently by the government of Saudi Arabia against uh, the journalist Jamal Khashoggi who had gone to Turkey um, to renew his passport or uh, whatever it was he was doing. And all of these assassinations um, never really, these political assassinations in the Middle East by the Middle Eastern governments, they never get justice. And, or they're, these attackers, these perpetrators are never really tried. So there is never a happy ending, uh, as much as there can ever be a happy ending when it comes to a political assassination, to these stories. And the only thing that initially drew me to this particular assassination is because um, it did get justice. So it is in a league of its own because unlike all the others, it, it has a very different ending from all the others that took place. So sometimes when I give this speech, I begin very much like um, we as Jews do at the Seder. 
what is the difference between this assassination from all the other assassinations that happened before. And it is profoundly unique, and I will try to explain as much as I can why. Um, in its uniqueness, it also bears a great deal of um, highly interesting and relevant information for the rest of us about the, the uh, enduring legacy of the Holocaust. Um, the assassination, as some of you already know, took place in Berlin, Germany. And in my view, as I argue in the book, one of the reasons that these victims do end up getting uh, justice is because the political assassination happened in Berlin, Germany, because the justice system and the people involved, the prosecutors, the attorney general, were people who refused to bend to political pressure to do something uh, other than the absolute right thing, legal thing to do, that this case got the justice that it did get, and I'll try to get into that as well. And perhaps most importantly, it, given how much Iran is discussed in the news, that we hear about JCPOA, you know, the um, uh, nuclear agreement with Iran, there's always a threat of war by someone, you know, generally by the United States against Iran, and we are always contemplating whether uh, there should be a war or shouldn't be a war. Um, whereas the truth is, what happened as a result of this case, which had nothing to do with any sort of military intervention or any act of violence, was one of the most effective, and until about five years ago, the most effective measure any government has ever taken against Iran. And what is very, very unfortunate is that no one knows about it. So here's a case that did get justice, that, is, that has had very significant con consequences since the Holocaust, and we can show the reverberations of the legacy of the Holocaust through the way this, uh, these victims got justice, but, but also that politically this um, case was able to um, have a bigger impact inside Iran um, than, or bring in Iran a major transformation that nothing else has ever uh, been able to, including sanctions and war threats and all that. So I think, given all these qualifications, we ought to kind of look at it and see uh, what happened and how it happened. On September 17, 1992, in this really rundown restaurant that never was able to recover from this particular evening that we're going to visit now and recently shut down because of what happened. This restaurant in Berlin was the site of a dinner party or a dinner discussion get together of several Iranian opposition leaders, namely Kurdish opposition leaders here. They had gone, these Kurdish leaders had been invited to Germany on the invitations of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, because they, they were part of this umbrella uh, party. And they were there um, to, to meet with Germans and other Europeans. But some Iranians who were already in Germany invited the Kurdish leaders to come and meet them over dinner in this really shabby restaurant, which was called Mykonos. At the time, this fellow, whose name is uh, Sadiq Sharaf Gandhi, was the leader of the Iranian Democratic Kurdish Party. And he and two others had come to Germany. They had put down their guns. They were fighting in the Kurdish region. And they had come clandestinely into Germany to participate. So he and his two assistants and a few others gathered. They're here having dinner. And in about an hour after dinner is over, sometime just before 11 PM, three men come into the, the entrance of the restaurant. One of them stays in front of the door. The other two pull up their collars. They had, they had sort of uh, uh, big sweaters on. And uh, they hide their faces up to their eyes. And they go to the, back, to the table in the back of the restaurants where he 
and his colleagues and a few others were sitting, having, having just finished their dinner. And one of them, one of the two, um, had a sports bag on his shoulder in which he was hiding a uh, machine gun. He stands, he positions himself exactly across from this guy, and he was in the middle of a conversation. And when I spoke later to some of the people who survived the assassination, they said to me that we didn't realize that somebody had come, but he was already he had already made eye contact and he knew exactly, even before he was shooting, who he was. And so he went, his face went completely ashen. And then um, the chap takes, off, takes out the machine gun and starts to shoot at everybody. And then there's a second person, about, about um, eight or nine people were at the table. Um, then the, the second person who was next to him goes around and puts the coup de grace, the final shot in his head and the heads of his two assistants who had come with him. The others who had been invited to dinner and were there um, survived. The Germans the next day have to figure out who has possibly done this. So the fellow with the mustache is named Bruno Joost, and he's the person who the next morning after the assassination, gets a call and is, to, is assigned to go investigate the case. And he arrives on the scene, and he already had a Kurdish case, another assassination case, that he was investigating. And that case had led him to believe that this too was probably done either by Saddam Hussein, our, our very old <laughs> villain, um, or it was a case by the Turks who hate the Kurds more than any other government in, in the Middle East. So he was completely unaware or really uninterested in even considering that the assassinations may have been ordered by the government of Iran. So Bruno Yos gets the case and his boss, uh, who's on the left holding the tablet, who was the Attorney General of Germany at the time, Alexander von Stahl, told him, go investigate this, and we are not afraid of anything you might find out. Bring back to us anything that you discover. Um, so he does. In the morning papers, everybody agree that this is uh, the work of Saddam Hussein, Iraqis or the Turks. Meantime, a group of Iranian opposition members who lived in Germany organized a demonstration in front of the restaurant, and they were certain that it had been ordered by the government of Iran. And uh, the journalists are dumbfounded because they think that, oh, opposition members, you know, they always have the same tune. It's our government, it's our government. So they ask these um, opposition members who are demonstrating, in front of the restaurant, less than 24 hours, do you have proof? And they say, we don't need proof. Uh, this government, the government of Iran, has been going around the world uh, conducting assassinations against the dissidents, against people like us, against artists, writers, satirists, uh, political opposition for uh, the past, you know, since the Iranian revolution in 1979, and this is 1992. Uh, but of course, Bruno Yos, the prosecutor, the attorney general, uh, German reporters who were, had been assigned to the story needed hard facts, and they, they had yet to have any. So I'd like to take you back to our prosecutor, the, the man with the mustache, Bruno Yost. And this is a moment from the book where he has uh, looked at this scene, and he is trying to process the information in his head. By midnight on September 19, 1992, Bruno Yost had examined the scene, which was more gruesome than any he had ever seen before. He had talked to his colleagues and local and federal police, read witness statements, and looked over the autopsy reports as they came in. He valued these early insights not simply because they advanced his knowledge of the case, 
They also became his yardstick by which to measure the quality of the future information. Among his most startling discoveries was something that no one, not even the survivors or the relatives of the dead, had considered. A crime of that magnitude could not have happened so cleanly, swiftly, and flawlessly without the help of an insider. Someone at the restaurant had collaborated with the killers. Was he still at large or among the dead? This would be the first of several questions to gnaw at him in the weeks to come. He had unearthed more than most investigators could, a credit to two qualities in him that were easily overlooked. Firstly, Yost thought himself a servant to a master named Law. He did not shy away from the drudgeries of an investigation. He respected, but he did not believe in mediators, which was what he thought of everyone who reported to him. He hardly ever delegated even the lowliest of tasks to his assistants. The brilliance of the truth he was to piece together, he believed, was in the luster of every detail that went into it. He feared what might be lost in the journey that a fact made from the lips of a witness to the pen of an overtired agent. Besides, he could not claim to be a superior to those who had seen what he had not, talked to those that he had not, measured the distances he had not walked. To earn the respect of his co-workers, to prevent the possibility of ever being told he was wrong because he had not been present on the scene, he traced in, the, in their footsteps of all those who had first been dispatched and repeated every tedious procedure they had performed in his absence. Secondly, Bruno Yost was also a self-effacing man. His unassuming ways, the only item of luxury on him, was the wisp of gold band on his ring finger, deflected attention from him. He so often yielded to colleagues, so easily lent an ear to everyone, that witnesses, experts, or police officers spoke unreservedly in his presence, as if he were merely eavesdropping. A smile readily creased his lips to ease his subordinates, as did his lilac gaze. Whatever flaws or shortcomings existed in your characters, they did not get in the way of his equanimity. Indeed, nothing caused Yos to lose his stride, not the armed bodyguards shadowing him, the frozen expressions of the corpses he examined, the tantrums of traumatized witnesses, or the cunning of the detainees who spun tale after tale to evade his questions. Nothing upset his peace for long because nothing could surpass in strangeness what he had witnessed as a child. Until the year he left for college, Bruno Yost lived on the grounds of an insane asylum. His father was an attendant there and, and had an apartment on the premises. Growing up near the patients had inured him to strangeness. Sudden howls, frantic fits, gloomy countenances, bizarre rituals, and violent threats did not intimidate him. He had learned long ago how to stare into havoc and see past it. And that's him, uh, the guy in the mustache and glasses. I managed to, with the help of the New York Bar Association, fly into New York to receive an award from the New York Bar Association called the Rule of Law Award uh, for the work that he did on this case. And the Attorney General, who actually was fired from his position of Attorney General of Germany in 1993 as a result of assigning Joost and supporting Joost through this investigation, practically lost a very promising political career. So with the help of the New York Bar Association, we flew both of them in to New York, gave them these awards, rule of law awards, and sent them home, letting them know that um, they had not been forgotten. So what happens is that Bruno Yost, who was 
quite certain in the beginning that it had been Saddam Hussein, or then later on that it had been Turkey, uh, little by little uh, learns about uh, one major fact that um, after the 1979 revolution in Iran, there had been a list that had been drawn by the Iranian leadership of some 500 individuals that Iran was pursuing around the globe uh, and trying to assassinate. In fact, the first of these assassinations had happened in Potomac, Maryland, in the United States um, in 1979. Um, an Iranian exile who had been the Minister of Education uh, was sitting at home. There's a knock on, on his door. He opens. There is a man who's dressed uh, as a UPS delivery guy who, um, uh, who comes to his door. As soon as he opens the door, he shoots him and then, um, and then escapes. The country goes into Iran. And so Bruno Yost learns that this is part of a systematic effort at eliminating any opposition member that Iran has uh, throughout Europe, in America, anywhere you can imagine. In Italy, Rome, there had been an assassination. In Paris, uh, in Vienna, Austria, uh, everywhere on the map that the Bruno Yo set up a map in his office, and the more he learned, the more he realized that there are dots that, that are connected on this map. Um, but the interesting thing is that all these assassinations, all these crimes had happened, and every one of the perpetrators had gotten away with it. Why? Because the European governments knew very well that Iran was killing its own dissidents, and they really didn't care. Um, in the same way that, in some ways, when Khashoggi was assassinated a few months ago, uh, the first reaction from the Saudis was, what's it to you? You know? Um, he's not even a US citizen. And people kept emphasizing, but he had a green card. And I'm thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Um, ec these extraterritorial, extrajudicial um, assassinations, political assassinations, have been going on. And so all the other European countries were, one way or another, uh, dusting these assassinations under the rug. And none had ever gotten the sort of justice that they deserved, any justice, in fact. Um, some of them even detained, arrested the perpetrators, the killers, and then deported them uh, back to Iran citing national security interests and national interests. So then, on this very uh, scene of many, many you know, European governments who already know this is going on, have told Iran, please don't do it, and Iran hasn't listened, uh, tell Bruno Yost, it's the same story, you know, but please try to shove it under the rug like all the other ones, because um, we are having good trade relations with Iran, and we are trying to keep the trade going, and hopefully, you know, all the other excuses uh, that they bring up uh, in order to put trade in front of human rights and justice. But Bruno Yo says, that's not why I went to law school. <laughs> that there is no way that I will do, that I will bend to pressure. So, but in order to do that, he needed the approval of the Attorney General. And he goes to the Attorney General, he turns in the indictment, which is sort of a wrap-up summary of his investigation, which leads him to the leadership in Iran as sort of the masterminds of, uh, uh, of these assassinations, as the people who have ordered this. And the Attorney General says, I'm with you. Even if it costs Germany um, some trade deals, even if we have to cut off relations with Iran, this is the right thing to do. Um, it's very interesting because in the week before the trial was about to open, which is October of, October of 1993, the family of Ron Arad, the missing Israeli pilot, flies into Germany and begs with these two and others within the German government to negotiate with Iran because 
during that time, during the time that the Arad family had come to Germany, um, the minister of, Iran's minister of intelligence had also come to Germany and they had said, he had said to his counterparts, if you stop this trial from starting, which was, which was to start in late October of 1993, we will free any kidnapped person that you want, uh, that we might have, or we might be able to negotiate for you in the Middle East. It, and so Arad's family were really pushing um, for the Germans to say yes to, the, to Iran's Minister of Intelligence so that they could get their son back. The German counterpart, the German Minister of Intelligence at the time was Bernd Schmidtbauer. He says, I would very much like to stop this trial from starting, but I have no power over our justice system. It's an, it's no, it's, it's an independent judiciary. And as much as we like to lean on it, to stop it, to, to uh, force the prosecutor to keep the scope of this investigation limited, we can do nothing. And the fact is that I believe um, it is in light of World War II and the lessons that Germany learned and the re-imagination um, and the restructuring of the German justice system that a justice system so independent had been created that as much as the German administration wanted to make this case go away, they could not convince the two of them to do what they were asking. And that's really the most amazing part or one of the most amazing uh, elements of this story that in a way uh, we had an Atticus Finch in Germany who was unwilling uh, to let go, who was unwilling to bend to power and he persisted and persisted and persisted. So this is the wife of the non-Kurdish man who was killed in the assassination. I interviewed everybody and somebody asked me today, you know, did you just go over uh, police reports and, you know, uh, documents from that you gathered? I gathered all those things. In fact, uh, a group of people in Germany wanted to turn the restaurant into a museum of this case. And so they came to me to, to collect artifacts because um, I ended up spending about three years going back and forth uh, with my babysitter and my uh, newborn children to Germany so that we could uh, camp out and so that I could interview and research uh, the story. And one of the many, many, many people whom I interviewed at length, and I was lucky enough to get to talk to because I realized later on that as, as a result of all the legal pressures on a variety of uh, characters at the time of the trial, many people who the reporters would have liked to reach and talk to had not talked to them. And uh, when I got to Germany, the case had been over for many years and many people who had something to say and had not been able to say it were now ready to speak. So I got lucky and I managed to bring out a whole slew of people forth uh, to say things to me that they had never said. So she is the wife of one of the four people who died in the restaurant that night and she played an important part. I asked her, when I first went to her house, I usually let uh, my subjects ask the questions that they might have because I want them to know that um, it's a two-way street, that, that I'm willing to answer whatever I know before I ask them questions. So I asked her if she had any questions for me before I started and she said, where were you on 9-11? I wanted to say what does that have to do with anything, uh, but I said that I was working in um, television production and news production and I was in New York in fact. And I said, where were you on 9-11? And she said that she was glued to her television set in Berlin, Germany, sobbing for three days in a row, watching the ruins and thinking about the widows. And she says that I know exactly what they were going through and my impulse was to fly into New York and go find the widows 
and, and join them in solidarity. Um, I found it very moving, and I really liked the way she connected one act of terrorism to another act of terrorism, um, even though the two had nothing to do with each other. But in her mind, terrorism is terrorism. When I went to see her, I was contemplating whether I should do the book or not, and she convinced me um, that I should. So she went, she changed her job. She took a night job so that for the three and a half years that the trial was ongoing, she could be there every day during the trial in dressed in black. And she did nothing but stare. But she believes that being there every day in black, staring, was important. And I have to believe that it was. So I said in the beginning of my talk that the upshot from this case, the result of this case, was unlike anything else, any other pressure that has ever been placed on Iran before. And here's why. On April 10, uh, 1997, the, the court, which had been nearly in session for four years, finally put out its judgment. Um, it was not a verdict because there was no jury. It was a judgment that came from uh, an assembly of five justices. And um, they did something that um, no other government that had ever um, witnessed one such assassination had ever done. They implicated the leadership of Iran in having ordered the assassinations. They named the current Iranian supreme leader, who was the supreme leader at the time, his foreign minister, his minister of intelligence, the head of the Revolutionary Guards, and a couple of other people. In, in name, they named names in the judgment and called them the architects of the murders. As a result of this historic uh, judgment, uh, first time ever that, by the way, since Nuremberg, a government that was in power was named uh, criminal in Germany was this. And as a result, every EU country withdrew its ambassador from Iran at the end of April 1997, all of Europe had no ambassador, no consular section in Tehran at all. So what was interesting is that up until now, up until this time, Iran had no relations with the US. It still doesn't have relations with the US. And it's somewhat easy for the Iranian government to justify that we don't want to have a relationship with with the United States because of A, B, and C. But it was, became impossible at the end of April 1997 for the government of Iran to justify why it didn't have a relationship with Italy, with France, with England, with Portugal, with all of these smaller nations throughout Europe too. As a result, in June of 1999, there was a presidential election in Iran. And the candidate that had been way, way, way back behind every other candidate at the time was a guy named Mohammad Khatami, who was a so-called reformist candidate, who was completely neglected and ignored, ran ahead and, and really surpassed all the other candidates and became president. As a result of this case, all of these assassinations, extrajudicial assassinations by Iran, stopped, which is really, really important because until, even until 1996, which is a year prior to this judgment, they were going through the, throughout the world, globally, Europe, everywhere, and just shooting, 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 shooting. And then this case um, forced them to stop. And not only that, but it also ushered a, a new era into the Iranian politics, which is called the reform era. There was, there was an openness uh, as a result of this grand political pressure on the government of Iran 
that really blew up the uh, civil society and opened it up in a way that it had never been uh, since 1979. And I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. So why isn't there an effort to uh, change the uh, name of Iran uh, from Iran back to Persia, which is reminiscent of a great civilization? Iranians in Los Angeles have, have already done it. If you ask anybody in Los Angeles, what are you, they'll say, I'm a Persian, Persian-American. Um, I refuse to say it because I think people who, who introduce themselves this way um, don't want the burden of explaining everything that I explained today. Don't want to represent a very difficult time or take the trouble of trying to come up with explanations for what's going on. But, but they are doing it, and I think if any of these people um, end up in power, um, there probably will be an effort at uh, renaming the country. Uh, the question is, in 1979 there was a revolution, can there be another um, to, to replace the current regime? I don't know. Um, you know, the, the reason I am reluctant uh, even though I love revolutions, they're really exciting. I lived through one. Uh, and even though the, the outcome was quite horrible, uh, the period of the revolution itself was quite exciting. What can I say? Uh, I'm a revolution junkie. Um, so um, I think that when I look at all the uprisings uh, around the globe in the past 10 years, uh, probably with the exception of Tunisia, uh, Everyone else has failed. You know, again, I was talking about this, Venezuela, Syria, Libya, uh, Egypt, Iran, most recently Sudan. Uh, it seems like that the public does what the public is supposed to do. They take their lives into their hands, they go to the streets, they even, um, you know, suffer through foodlessness, um, physical violence, threats, imprisonment, arrests, and all those things. But these regimes don't fall. Um, in, in the case of Syria, um, your Vladimir Putin and my uh, Iranian uh, government went in and bolstered Assad. And so even though uh, there are you know, five million refugees later and hundreds of thousands of people dead, and a country in ruins, uh, he stays in power. Uh, I think, I'm very sad to say this, but I think the same will happen, will be the result of Venezuela's uprising too. Um, because already today, Peru, for instance, said that it will no longer accept refugees from, from Venezuela. That after a while, when they don't resolve uh, these uprisings and these uh, internal situations, then you know, the refugee crisis will also not be tolerated. So I, I've come to a point where I believe that without some sort of global pressure, uh, global solidarity, um, that these uprisings cannot succeed. So um, Iranians have been on the streets for the past year and a half. Women have been defying the mandatory dress code in Iran, the, the veil, mandatory veil. They take it off, they walk on the streets, they get arrested, they go to prison. They come out, they take it off again, and they walk on the streets again. It's the closest thing I have seen to, to a resurgence of suffragist movement uh, somewhere else. That they say, you know, you can wear the veil if you like, it's my right to decide for my body and that what I want to wear or not. So everything is there, they're doing all the right things, they're not succeeding. And I, I know what Mahatma Gandhi said, I know what Martin Luther King said, I know what Nelson Mandela said, but I think that age is over. The age of people showing up nonviolently and succeeding. And I think that today, without some sort of global pressure, um, people who show up uh, with empty hands cannot face tanks and machine guns alone. I'm glad you asked. So the question is that in, I released the book in 2011, so this happened in 2012, that Iran um, 
uh, an Iranian agent was arrested uh, before he was able to uh, orchestrate and carry out an assassination against the Saudi ambassador to the US uh, at a restaurant in Washington. And the question is, why didn't I bring it up? I brought it up in 2012. Uh, it was an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And I was sitting there with my book, and I ended up on the Charlie Rose show too, and I sat there with my book saying, um, I wish I hadn't been right, but I am right, uh, saying that Iran does this. But up until then, up until 2012, Iran had not done any more of these assassinations in Europe or the, in the United States. So that was an anomaly that didn't even succeed. And the guy went to prison, and I think he's still there. So I think you're correct to point out that there was that exception. Uh, it was a failed exception, and on, from 1997 until 2012, um, there had been no assassinations by Iran against dissidents in Europe and the United States. So, you know, if you were an Iranian dissident, you would consider that a victory. What's the greatest challenge I had in writing this book, and what is the topic of what I'm writing now? Well, first of all, I, I had uh, my, I have twin boys, and when I started looking into this, they were two. And, and I also, you know, like probably all the other mothers, uh, I didn't want to leave them home, but I really wanted to do this too. Uh, and it was all the way across the ocean, so, so, and I got a very small advance. Um, but I probably spent every penny of that advance to uh, pay for my babysitter and to take my boys with me uh, to Germany. And we were there once uh, for a whole month. And then I came back uh, again and went back and forth and back and forth uh, for you know, another dozen times. So that was one difficulty that you know, I, was really, I felt really torn. And it wasn't easy because, you know, generally reporting jobs can take less time. So, you know, you do a two-week two deal and then hopefully it's done. But this was a very protracted, very big um, story all the way um, in another country. And then there were elements. I mean, um, two of the perpetrators had uh, served their full terms and had been sent, deported back to uh, Lebanon. Uh, so I contemplated going to Lebanon to, uh, and talking to them, but then I uh, thought, you know, if I were single, didn't have any attachments, I would have done that. So I guess that was one difficulty. The second one was uh, after the book was published, I had expected um, a great reception from the Iranian expatriate community. It didn't come. And in the long run, I think that somehow it was interpreted as kind of uh, dishonoring or you know, making, making Iranians look bad. And I have uh, always believed that the greatest uh, political leaders anywhere in the world are the people who hold their governments accountable. Um, you know, uh, and I always say that you know, nobody made a statue of Martin Luther King in 1950s, but there is a statue of Martin Luther King in Washington now. So I, I believe that it takes time um, for people to see it that way, but I, I can't say I wasn't disappointed. I'm currently working on a book <laughs> called America for Beginners, colon, a, a handbook for the immigrant and the perplexed. <laughs> so I'm, I'm writing uh, my own version of a guidebook to understanding America and Americans. <laughs> What's the current relationship between Germany and Iran, and are there any repercussions? Um, there are repercussions because when I went to the intersection of Germany at the United Nations, and said, you guys, you know, two of your greatest justice ministry figures are about to receive uh, an award from the American Bar Association in New York. So are you going to send a representative or a statement? 
And they said, not at all. And, and you know what was very strange for me was that <laughs> the ambassador took me in. We had a lovely conversation. He told me that I had written a brilliant book, that he really, really liked it, but that as Mr. Ambassador, he couldn't support it at all because every person that was mentioned in this judgment is still in power in Iran, and he didn't want more trouble than they had already had. So it was, it was very bizarre, and, and I felt very badly for, you know, this German Atticus Finch who, who really should be acknowledged but has been sort of sent to been sent to the archives of history and has been forgotten, which, uh, which is, I did my own small part to try to uh, bring him back. I think uh, Germany um, does still try to spearhead uh, some sort of like uh, EU, Iranian um, mediation, uh, but, but everybody else who remembers this case, case keeps bringing it up and reminding them that it will go nowhere. Despite the fact that um, Iran, uh, Iran's regime changed in 1979 and there, is, there has been for the past 40 years a regime in power that on and off has been incredibly anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, um, there continues to be a Jewish community in Iran. Uh, in relatively significant numbers, uh, considering the region and all the problems that are going on. Uh, there is at least uh, 10,000 Jews in Iran today, which uh, after Israel and probably Turkey, yeah. uh, makes Iran the largest home to any Jewish community outside of those two countries in the entire Middle East. Um, so one of the questions that everyone is curious about and people often ask me, and uh, I find very interesting to try to answer is that why do they stay? Why are those 10,000 people still there? And um, despite all the opportunities and, and uh, possibilities that have been put before them by various um, uh, organizations such as HIAS and, and others, uh, they continue to be there. They have ways of getting to Israel or coming to America or elsewhere, although that has been complicated now, coming to America with the presidential ban on the, on the five countries, uh, Iran, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, etc. cetera. Um, but still it is possible for members of the Jewish community to leave if they want to and, and they don't. So um, it's a, the million dollar question is why do they continue to be there? Um, in a relatively extensive article that I wrote um, in the Tablet Magazine, which is online, an online Jewish publication, um, I explained that I believe that um, the, uh, the community stays because its relationship with uh, the general Iranian public is very different than what it probably was. Uh, prior to 1979, prior to the Iranian Revolution. What do I mean? Prior to the Iranian Revolution, the general public, or at least um, the Iranian intellectuals and some of the um, supporters of Ayatollah Khomeini, or those who wanted to overthrow the government of uh, the, uh, the monarchy, the government of the Pahlavis, um, were probably um, on less sympathetic to the Jews because uh, it was very clear back then that the Jewish community uh, was under the protection of the monarchy. And, and the more the opposition to the monarchy uh, increased, then the more the Jewish community appeared to be in the camp with the monarchy. And I think that created a rift between the Jewish community and the general population in Iran. Using that same formula, I think that relationship has completely shifted now. The general public is against the current um, government, is against the uh, people, the leadership that's in uh, authority in Iran right now. 
Um, and therefore, the Jewish community, uh, which feels the same way, is uh, far more in, in solidarity with the general community in Iran than, than it used to be prior to 1979. So I think that that shift within where the Jewish community was vis-a-vis -vis its relationship to uh, the leadership in power and where and uh, prior to and after the revolution is the reason um, why they feel uh, far less persecuted, um, far more in solidarity with the general population, and they um, continue to stay because as much as the regime itself uh, spews anti-Semitic, anti-Israel uh, positions, the general population in the opposition with the leadership is, has become far more sympathetic to the Jewish community and to Israel in general. So when uh, several years ago, um, uh, ADL ran a very large, um, very comprehensive study of uh, the state of anti-Semitism in the world, in all of the Middle East, Iran, the, Iran's population ended up being or scoring the lowest in that ranking um, for anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli uh, feelings. And um, so they stay because the general population, in my view, is against uh, the leadership. And as a result, they are against the, the, the leadership's propaganda and therefore far have become over the years far more sympathetic to the Jewish community and to Israel in general. I'm happy to take a couple of questions if you have any. Okay, uh, the question is Iranians are obviously not Arabs and how does that figure into the equation? Um, that, that does figure into the equation, but Iranians were not Arabs um, 40 years ago or 50 years ago uh, either. And I think in some ways, um, it's very interesting to look at the shift of the attitudes um, towards Israel in Iran. So the regime instituted a day called um, the Quds Day or Jerusalem Day, which is um, the day of Yom Ha'atzma'ut every year. So um, that's a, that has been called a national holiday and people are supposed to demonstrate on the streets against Israel on, on that particular day. Um, well, nobody does demonstrate anymore. Um, and, and sure, it is probably because, you know, somewhat because Iranians are not Arabs, but also because um, they don't wish their government to support foreign forces, uh, including the Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, when there are so many economic crises and uh, problems in their own country. So um, I think the regime's conduct over the years and support of uh, organizations, as you mentioned, in the region, uh, Hezbollah, and to, to a smaller uh, degree, you know, Yemenis, uh, Yemenis uh, rebels, uh, has caused people to feel that all the budget and the funding that should be going to building the nation is, going, is being wasted elsewhere. So the question is, is, it, is, is the uh, antipathy towards just the uh, religious leadership or the uh, leadership of Iran, political leadership as well? And, and I don't think there's a separation because I think um, they have been in power long enough not to have the excuse uh, or for them to have used up the excuse that, uh, you know, it's the religious leadership that is oppressing you. We really want to give you freedom, but we can't. I think that that kind of worked for a few years in the late 90s and has no validity anymore. So I don't think people separate the two uh, any longer. So the question is that uh, Iran has a huge water and other economic crises, but uh, very seriously it has, um, it has mismanaged its... Uh, water sources and there is now um, a very dire uh, crisis of uh, water shortage to the point that last year, um, late summer, there were demonstrations for water. There were people who took to the streets um, because they didn't have clean water to, um, to drink. And 
And so the gentleman is asking why isn't Iran or how is Iran justifying the fact that Israel has figured out how to, um, how to uh, recycle its, um, uh, and desalinate its water sources and how Iran justifies the fact that it's, it's not accessing or asking Israelis to share the technology and the knowledge with them. Um, I think in the same way that they justify probably everything else, that you know, um, we, we do not use what the Zionists have to give us. We will figure it out and manage on our own. Um, I, um, that's, that's what I think is going on. Uh, Iran has been very resistant to accepting any sort of help from Israel, um, including uh, allowing its um, athletes to uh, compete with Israelis in, in um, all sorts of games, athletic games anywhere. So the question is that there has been widespread labor strikes throughout Iran, and can the labor strikes become something bigger? There has been serious labor strikes in addition to protests and demonstrations by women, which I think is sort of the story that no one is telling about Iran. There is a wonderful, very comparable to the suffragist movement um, that began in the West um, to gain equal rights for women a um, hundred some years ago um, that is taking place in Iran. And I think it's one of the best news anybody can get about the Middle East and about Iran. Uh, unfortunately, given all the other crises, it's uh, receiving very little coverage. So yes, there is labor strikes and there is a serious uh, women's movement uh, demanding for equal rights. So I think the labor movement goes on, the women's movement goes on. But in my belief, um, it's very difficult for these populations to succeed without global support. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.